This is another Eye Raw podcast. Hi, welcome to Storytelling Animals, a green new podcast of climate, ecology, and animal justice. Um, I'm your host, Aiden Martindale, and you may have noticed that at the beginning there is a new intro um, announcing that I am, uh, or Storytelling Animals is part of the Eye Roar Pod network. Um, you can check out other uh, pro animal podcasts at iroarpod.com, I R O A R P O D.com. Um, as well as you can find uh, my episodes. So I'm excited to be part of this network. Um, excited that there are lots of other uh, podcasts out there trying to make the world a better place for the other creatures we share it with. Um, and excited that there is lots of material for such podcasts to cover, uh, including mine. So today's guest for me is Ron Brolio. He's a professor of English at Arizona State University. And he's the author, most recently, of Animal Revolution, um, which is kind of an interesting, short, nonfiction uh, book, basically about the ways in which animals, you know, consciously and not, are resisting human culture, human industry, human economy, um, basically just by nature of being themselves, by being their bodies, and reminding us that, you know, as much as sometimes it seems we might like to, we cannot separate ourselves from the rest of the earth uh, and the rest of the creatures we share it with and we must account for them yeah in all of our actions so it's like it's a really creative and often funny book um, and I hope that you enjoy the interview Um, before we get there just a couple quick announcements Uh, as always please consider supporting this podcast on patreon at patreon.com slash storytelling pod thank you so much to those of you who already do And really, I uh, would be extremely grateful to any further contributions people can make. It's a small monthly sum. It works out to about a dollar an episode at the Thoreau tier, which is the lowest level. And yeah, it means that I can spend more time on this, means I can, you know, improve my website, improve my equipment. Uh, And yeah, it means that I can keep this going into the longer term. Um, So... Yes, if you can support this podcast on Patreon, uh, patreon.com slash storytellingpod, you also get perks such as ability to ask me questions, ability to get early access to episodes. At some levels, you get to hear who I'm interviewing beforehand and contribute questions, um, get to be part of the Storytelling Animals Book Club. Uh, We've now scheduled our book club out to the end of the year. Up next is Parable of the Sower on September 29th. Uh, more info at DaytonMartindale.com slash book club. Um, and yeah, there's lots of other stuff. And if, uh, you know, if that's too much for you, you can still support the podcast non-financially through um, subscribing to my free weekly newsletter, through rating this podcast, sharing it on social media, texting it to a friend, stuff like that. Okay, back to the animal revolution. author of Animal Revolution. Uh, Ron, thanks so much for coming on the show. My pleasure. Um, so, yeah, let's let's maybe start uh, backing up a bit to just how did you become interested in writing about animal issues? Right, so back around 2000, I got a PhD in British Romanticism. Uh, so that's Wordsworth and Coleridge Keats, that kind of work. Okay. And... A lot of those authors are writing about the landscape, but the landscape seems to some degree passive. And I was interested in an active landscape, an ecological landscape, where the landscape is pushing back against the humans as much as the humans scripting or writing about the landscape. So one of the obvious agents there is animals. And I got interested in animals during that time period, including things like cattle breeding, um, Edward Jenner using cowpox as a vaccine for smallpox. And then later I got interested in contemporary artists today working with animals because they were asking really interesting questions about animal minds and how to represent animal minds to our human world as well as how do we try to represent animals and misrepresent animals? Mm-hmm. So, 
your your book touches on a lot of these themes. Um, I I really did like it. I kind of you know fell in love from the first page where you talk about trying to give weapons to other animals. But it's it's hard to describe the book, I think. So how do you describe Animal Revolution to other people? Right. So it's kind of speculative nonfiction. It's nonfiction. All the stories in there happened. Some of it's speculative or playful. And I leverage humor in a way. Humor can be political because humor is always playing with cultural boundaries of what's acceptable. To that degree, it's political. But... It also allows us to recognize our boundaries and sometimes laugh at them, but then also engage them more seriously. So there is this kind of playful element to the work that also has an edge to it, like handing the animals weapons and then saying, well, they look at me blankly because they're like, why are you handing me this? We have our own revolution and our own way of doing things. Uh, I I think that's something you emphasize in the book, which is that the other animals are not waging a revolution as humans would wage a revolution, but in a specifically animal, non-human way. Um, Why is it so important to, to bring out the animality of it? Right. So there are several things there. One is I even say, you know, the term revolution is our term and what they're doing is on their terms. So I talk a little bit about that. But also I'm really interested in the uh, philosopher Thomas Nagel and his essay, What's It Like to Be a Bat? And in that essay, he says, well, we'll never fully know what it's like to be a bat. We know that there's something that's like bats know it we don't and so i'm really interested in this problem is there of there are types of knowing that remain uh ineffable to us or um closed off to us in some way or we can get small windows onto it because we can see how the animals react to their world um recently there's a book by ed young an immense world how animals sense and reveal hidden realms. And Jung and I are both working on this problem uh, through a biologist, uh, Jacob von Uxkull, who does biosemiotics, or how animals use their biological senses to make sense and meaning in their world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, uh, animal revolution, what are some of the ways that the animals are revolting. I mean, there are a bunch of examples through the book, but um, what are some of your favorite instances of of ways in which animals are resisting in some way? You know, I really like the one with the radioactive boar who are in eastern Germany and people don't touch them because they're wild boar and they're radioactive. And the idea is that them working with there is that they're radioactive because they're eating tubers that have absorbed the radiation from the Chernobyl disaster, nuclear disaster. And they bring that disaster back to us. So while we've evacuated the space, the area, and want to move on from our disasters and kind of repress it, they're the return of the repressed. Or as I say, in some ways, they're the Godzilla. They're the monsters that make us realize we've made some mistakes and we need to correct them. So that's one of the ones that's really been interesting for me. Another one is the jellyfish, where the there are these kind of floating swarm of jellyfish that end up stopping the largest U.S. aircraft carrier, uh, the Ronald Reagan. And what happens is the Reagan uh, is nuclear powered so it has to suck in seawater for its coolant systems to cool the nuclear reactors and in doing so it sucks up uh, almost 2,000 pounds of jellyfish flesh and the jellyfish jam the uh, the the seawater intake valves that prevent the uh, cooling of the system and they have to shut down the engines So I was really interested in how these creatures unwittingly end up um, saying, well, 
through their very physical flesh end up saying, hey, this space is ours. You know, this ocean isn't just yours, humans. And time and again, there are these incidents where animals through fur and feather and, uh, and claw put themselves on the line physically saying that their world counts as well. And that's that meeting point, right, between humans and animals is, well, our technology tried to get us away from the contact with the earth and make our lives easier and frictionless. In fact, we're still part of this earth, the shared earth between us and other animals. And it's in that shared earth and spaces in that shared earth, there's a friction or a jamming of our social gears. You know, you, you mentioned that revolution is a human term. And I think, um, yeah, maybe there's an idea that it invokes something uh, cordon, more coordinated or, uh, you know, with maybe a more specific intent about what comes next. Uh, but what in, you know, in those examples of the jellyfish or the boar, what makes those fit the word revolution to you? Right. It's much like humans want to use the word intelligence for what humans do in rational thought, but leave out the different kinds of intelligence of other animals. So in some ways, you can change the word intelligence from a human-only term to a broader spectrum of ways of thinking that include ways the other animals think. And the same, I think, is true for revolution, that we have a kind of narrower term sometimes that it has to involve uh, human political systems and, and our own will and conscious desires. But in fact, in looking at human revolutions, people revolt for a lot of unconscious reasons as well. And even those in the revolution have slightly different reasons they might be pushing back, right? So there are splinter groups or different causes within a revolution. So I'm noticing that, you know, there's not a kind of purity to our human term either. But what's interesting for me in the animal revolution is the sense that um, we have so dominated the earth that we should be expecting these kinds of pushbacks. And one of the goals in the book is to just make people think these animals are everywhere. They're pushing back everywhere. And daily we find these kind of one-off stories about an animal, you know, escaping a zoo or cattle escaping a slaughterhouse or um, um, an octopus stealing a camera from someone and taking a whole bunch of video. So we see these kind of strange animal encounters and incidents or animals pushing back. And what I'm trying to do with this almost litany of different stories is to get the sense that this is an ongoing project for the animals and it's happening everywhere. And so every time you might see one of those, one incident in the news or encounter it yourself, you'll be thinking of all these others and realize wow, there is a much bigger earth out there. Yeah, I, you know, you talked about the friction earlier between a culture that in some ways is trying to separate ourselves from the rest of the living world and the fact that that living world is still there, it's not tamed, and if we ignore it or pretend it's separate, it'll come back to bite us, perhaps literally. So within that friction, you talk about this idea of the exploit, uh, what is that? What is the exploit? Right. So the exploit. I'm borrowing the term from this philosopher Eugene Thacker and another his colleague uh, Alexander Galloway, and they have a book called The Exploit, where they talk about portals in computer systems that hackers use to gain entry. So they exploit these small portals or openings in order to gain entry to a whole system. And what I'm saying is that the animals are hacking into the human cultural system. And the portal is the fact that we also were animals. That is, we're physical body, animal bodies on this earth. 
And that portal, that shared earth, is the space where we meet with the animal world. So, for example, with the battleship and the, uh, the aircraft carrier and the jellyfish, the aircraft carrier has military superiority, but it hasn't accounted for the fact that it has a shared sea, a shared earth, with these jellyfish who feel the world differently, who see the world differently, who in- engage the world differently. And so in doing that, they're able to um, hack our system. They're able to uh, in- engage and enter into the uh, the the uh, they gain access to the to the engine room, as it were, and uh, and uh, affect the battleship. So it's that share. It's the idea that we have a shared materiality, a shared earth. Mm-hmm. Um, so maybe let's talk about how we can respond to this revolution. Um, one idea in the book that really struck me is this idea of radical hospitality. Um, I'm going to quote a couple sentences from the book. Uh, more broadly, you write, whose world is it? Whose future and who is in charge? Hospitality asks us to surrender our world, our plans, our space, and our power for someone else. Radical hospitality asks us to do all of this for an unforeseeable and unplanned other. We didn't ask for this, but we are thrown into a world with other beings, and the measure of ethics is how we relate to these others. So you use an example of a literal bowl in a china shop in that chapter, but what what does this hospitality entail, and what could it look like? Right, and here, uh, as with a lot of the book, Kind of the the back current of it is a whole bunch of philosophy that I only briefly put in or kind of playfully put in, and in this case, it's Jacques Derrida has an essay called "What Hospitality," and he says there's this idea, this grand idea of hospitality that will say yes to everyone and everything, and then there's the actual hospitality, how it's practiced, and he says. Basically, if we're just hospitable to our friends, well, that's friendship. That's not real hospitality. We're really not extending ourselves beyond uh, easy limits. He says the the more radical hospitality is to say yes to things we don't necessarily want. And so that's a more absolute hospitality. It's an ideal hospitality that our laws and rules and our practices don't usually come up against. So I'm interested in if we were to really push things to say, okay, how can we have this shared earth with other animals? And uh, the uh, recently deceased biologist, E.O. Wilson, right, had the book Half Earth with the proposition that we should designate half the earth for non-human life and just let it do its thing and not interfere. And even though that's perhaps unrealistic and in many ways for us or unpractical, um, those kinds of propositions really push an Overton window and really kind of push what might be possible and have us think differently. So a lot of this, um, the gestures of hospitality that I uh, make in the book and the examples I use, um, like a woman living with hundreds of rabbits, um, those are examples to help us imagine uh, a bigger world that we're not just c- trying to create an environmental space that is friendly just for humans, right? It's not just, you know, the re- there's the recent uh, bill that just passed uh, for a more environmental friendly system for humans and, and uh to uh, mitigate global warming. And that's great in climate change. But at the same time, we have to think, well, what's in it for the non-humans, right? I mean, they get residual benefits, perhaps, but how are we really extending ourselves to them, right? How are we making room for these others? So there's this strange and wonderful chapter in the book, uh, and maybe somewhat alarming uh, about dolphin communication and uh, a researcher a couple researchers in that field um can you can you tell us the story of 
those dolphin researchers and, and why you included that? Yeah, that's the story of Lilly, uh, Dr. Lilly, in the 1960s. And it's interesting, um, Graham Burnett writes uh, really eloquently about this, but basically uh, Lilly's research in the 60s spawned both the uh, TV show Flipper with an idealized dolphin uh, family uh, with humans, so Flipper, as well as Defense Department research on killer dolphins and both those strands end up in a a kind of b movie called the day of the dolphin with george c scott so it's really this kind of curious a lot of the book is these kind of weird mixture of cultural things and facts and stories and stories we tell ourselves and in this case lily had been working on probing uh putting really painfully putting uh cutting up the skulls cutting into the skulls of mammals and putting in probes to see how the brains work and where the wiring systems are and then he realized that dolphins have the largest brain to body ratio outside of humans so let's try it out on them uh he cuts into dolphins and uh, eventually realized that, and he, at one point, with one particular dolphin, he said that the dolphin was m- trying to make human sounds. It was trying to mimic the words that the, uh, the humans were saying around it. In other words, it was thinking outside itself and trying to appeal to the humans. And that changed all his research. He realized they were highly intelligent. And uh, so he then tries to begin human-dolphin communication in all kinds of strange ways. Like, you know, he gets into a sensory deprivation tank and pipes in dolphin sounds. He ends up dropping acid with dolphins. Uh, All these kind of different ways to try to get into another mind. And he really saw the dolphins as almost alien species on this earth and he he said in man and dolphin if we want to know what alien intelligence is like if we want to prepare ourselves for alien intelligence we should uh, first start with the dolphins and under, try to understand these aliens among us um, we see that today in some ways with the octopus and things like you know my octopus teacher and so forth that uh, we realize there are all these kind of alien intelligence here on this planet uh, worth uh, taking seriously and into consideration and making room for, again, hospitality for other ways of thinking and being in the world. Mm-hmm. You, you suggest that part of being in solidarity with the animal revolution is perhaps getting in touch with our own animality in some way uh, and spend time discussing sort of hybrid figures like the Sasquatch or the fawn. Uh, how, how can we go about this? Right. So one of the, I was once invited to a panel on, on zoos. It was a symposium on zoos. And I said, you know, I am the animal revolution guy, right? So you sure you want me there? They said, yeah, sure. Come on. We want to hear what you have to say. And I told them, you know, actually zoos, come from a particular way of classifying animals. They come from a Linnaean tradition of you know, genus and species and putting them behind bars. We have, you know, uh, or like a Noah's Ark, we have two of each, come see the animals. Eventually they became slightly more humane in creating ecologies for these animals. But nonetheless, they stayed within this idea of particular nomenclatures that really create mental bars between us and them and even uh, amongst them. So I was interested in how can we get outside those stories we're telling, those science stories, those kind of stories that create these divisions and bars. And I said, really, we need shaman rather than zoos. That is, we need people who engage, who take their own minds and risk going into non-human worlds. We need stories where we are connected 
to these animals, whether through totems or like Ovid's transformations and metamorphoses. We need these ways of creating narratives that help us think about our relationship to animals rather th in ways that don't keep them safely at a distance. Because they're not safely at a distance. They're, they're among us. They're part of this shared earth. So I got really interested in what are the kinds of stories and narratives we tell ourselves that help us engage with animals and the idea that we need new narratives. We need to make personal narratives to engage with the animals. And so the Sasquatch, the Bigfoot, has become uh, one of my companions, that and the goat. And one of the things about the Sasquatch that's interesting is this kind of missing link, this idea that there's an animal out there that's animal enough that it is, is part of the animal world, but human enough, perhaps, that it could tell us what it's like to be an animal. And I think, well, that's really a metaphor for who we are if we take seriously our own animality. Yeah, so maybe let's talk about uh, stories because there are a lot of, um, you know, fictional novels and, and films that, that make their appearance in your book um, that you offer some analysis of. Um, what, what are some of the, the stories that, um, and these can be, you know, new or recent, or they can be going back to, uh, you know, previous centuries if, if, uh, if you want. But um, what are some stories that you think do respond fruitfully to the animal revolution and, and respond to this, this call to include non-human agency? Right. So uh, I have one chapter in there. It's toward, toward the end. The, the book is kind of divided into two halves. So the first half is much more animals in revolt. And the second half, you have humans engaging with this revolution and trying to connect in different ways. So there's a chapter toward the end called The Crack, which uh, talks about a little girl who is falling asleep at night and all of a sudden be, uh, starts to identify with the animals she's encountered in, uh, the, in visiting a park. And one of the things that's interesting, you know, it's that kind of weird, hazy, semi-consciousness before going to sleep, that kind of dreamscape. And the other thing about that is it's, it's a child, right, who's, as, as we may remember from our own childhood, there's not a lot of divi as much division between the human world and the non-human world, right, the, uh, the animal world. Uh, kids often really love and identify with animals in ways that they haven't been socialized fully to understand that there are barriers between us and them. And so it starts with her thinking about Disney animals and her stuffed animals. So these kind of commercialized animals, which for her are, are totems to her understanding to non-human worlds. But then it becomes this um, moment where... Uh, she intensifies her engagement with those worlds and starts running around really fast saying, I'm a bee, I'm a bee, I'm a bee. Um, that was actually from an incident that happened with um, a daughter of a close friend of mine. She's running around with this kind of like, it's, it's not that she was flapping her wings, that, but she was through sheer speed becoming a bee, right? Becoming something other than, than human for a moment that is trying to think outside of the human world. And we've seen this, um, and then fr from those incidents, I go into talking about um, the cave art from uh, several, you know, tens of thousands of years ago, where the, uh, the drawings of that art are trying to engage with the world that's just on the other side of the cave, right? The different horses and the bison uh, or buffalo. So trying to engage with this other world just out there. And the cave becomes almost like this metaphor for the human skull or the human mind, this kind of trying to carve and write and understand this thing that's just on the other side and to engage with it. So I look at these kinds of 
moments where we're trying to, there's a crack in what it means to be human, and we're trying to actually think about what it's like to be another being. Yeah, I, I think uh, I did an episode maybe a month or so ago where um, I talked about some of the work of uh, the Indian writer novelist Amitabh Ghosh, um, and who kind of talks about how uh, traditionally myth and, and stories is is part of how we have made sense with our relationships with the rest of the world and other creatures, um, but that in so many of our contemporary, at least realist stories, um, at least realist stories for adults, as you mentioned, it's different for children. Uh, the the non-human kind of loses its loses its power or relevance. Right. Yeah, Amitav Ghosh is really interesting example of who writes about this problem of how can we change the ideas of narrative to engage with problems like climate change, like the uh, loss of uh, other species. And humans primarily organize their sense of meaning through narrative, you know, the stories we tell ourselves. So it, Ghosh and others, I think, are looking at what are the big foundational stories that we have been telling or that we tell ourselves now? How do they squeeze out or remove a sense of wonder of the non-human world? And then they begin to mine or look at earlier periods, earlier epics, where that sense of wonder still existed and try to incorporate that in different ways. Um, you know, my writing coach was Matt Bell, who wrote Appleseed. And in that case, he uses the uh, myth of Orpheus but also Dionysus and the Fawn um, as ways of getting at some of these problems of the human-animal world. Yeah, Matt Bell was a, a previous guest on this podcast. Um, uh, maybe I'll link my interview with him uh, in the episode description. Uh, but one of the things he talked about when he was on is, uh, you know, one of his goals that he stated for himself as he was writing was to go big with wonder as he said it, um, you know, some of the events in that novel are, um, you know, could be considered hopeful, some could be considered bleak, um, but throughout it there's kind of wonder pervading uh, for the natural world in a way that uh, is, is, the, is the emotion you take away more so than kind of the optimism-pessimism um, dichotomy there. Yeah, I think one of the things I've learned from him certainly is that, and also this idea of layering, so the um, in so my stories have um, they're kind of like a litany. So a litany might be seemingly random or a whole bunch of different things in a order that doesn't always quite initially make sense. But because you have big things and small things and um, animals of different varieties and different kinds of encounters, it seems to encompass a larger whole. And so both the use of litany and then layering where, you know, the, I'll start with maybe a small incident in a story, but then add further detail and further detail. And then you think you're done, but then there's more, you know, there, there are more kinds of radioactive animals besides the boar Then I introduced the rabbit, etc. cetera. Um, that uh, layering adds this other kind of texture or sense of a, uh, of a quite larger world. So, as you said, go, it goes big, and in that case, big with wonder. Mm -hmm. I want to bring up this uh, quote from towards the end of the book from The Lives of Animals by J.M. Kotzea. Um, and basically the, the whole book is uh, a, a woman giving a lecture at a college, um, largely about the lives of animals. Um, and she says... Anyone who says that life matters less to animals than it does to us has not held in his hands an animal fighting for its life. The whole of the being of the animal is thrown into that fight without reserve. When you say that the fight lacks a dimension of intellectual or imaginative horror, I agree. It is not the mode of being of animals to have an intellectual horror. Their whole being is in the living flesh. Uh, and so what... Um, 
I guess, do, do you agree with that? And, and what do you think is the, the power of that, that pronunciation? Yeah, really, um, that quote or that passage has moved me for many years. And one of the things I really like about it is that the animals think the world, their very, their very flesh is their mode of thinking, right? So oftentimes they're not using prosthetics. They're not using computers. They're not using eyeglasses. They're not using cell phones. They don't have these prosthetic modes of thinking. Their thinking is through their very flesh. And they have evolved genetically over time, or as Darwin, Darwin says, they have evolved in different ways, in order for their very being to be adapted to their environment. And their being, their flesh, their genes, how they're formed, is a mode of thinking or engaging with that environment. And so that's what I found most compelling there, is that the animals always have their bodies on the line in a way that we don't necessarily. We kind of keep our bodies at a distance. We don't risk as much as they do in their thinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think what's interesting to me about reading that passage is I, I do find it powerful, and but I think there is a, uh, a part of me and I think a part of generally the animal rights movement whose instinct is is always to say, um, to, I guess, minimize the differences between humans and other animals. Um, so if I hear uh, her say that there's not an intellectual or imaginative element to the horror, um, part of me wonders, you know, you know, people, I do hear people say, with, you know, talking about eating meat or whatever, or whether it's wrong to kill an animal, that they don't have, you know, they don't have the same plans for the future as we do. They live in the moment. And as I've talked about on other episodes of this podcast with, with other guests, um, this isn't necessarily true. Uh, there are, um, there are plenty of animals that in short-term and long-term ways make plans for the future, whether it's a bird caching food or, or, you know, a, a chimpanzee making a political ploy or whatever. Um, but then I think what's, uh, What's powerful about that passage is that in a way that also doesn't matter, or at least it's not the, the primary thing is not that they make plans for the future. You know, if when a, I don't know, a wildebeest is attacked by a lion or whatever, or perhaps shot by a human is, is an equally um, a more relevant example, like what's what's wrong there first and foremost to me or what's troubling there obviously wrong is the wrong word for a lion but i think what's what's lost there is that the that physical struggle um you know when you could talk about a fish on a deck after being fished uh you know it doesn't it's not like oh like this is only bad if that fish like has a plan for next tuesday right it's that that moment of immediate struggle is actually, I think, maybe the most immediate moral proof of of the value of their lives to them. Yeah, there's something beautiful there. I mean, uh, the animal wants to live, right? The mm -hmm. the the fish flopping around, squirming for for life, for breath, for air. You can see that this des this sheer physical des desire to live. Uh, that's incredibly powerful, and. Animal rights is an interesting space of thought. I think there, there are a variety of ways of thinking. One is um, they're like us, which is an appeal that is often necessary within the, um, the U.S. law, within the legal system, because it runs on a very human-centered and analytic framework. And then the other is... Uh, life itself is valuable, um, that all life, whether it looks like us or not, whether it has the kind of intelligence we count as intelligent or not, is also valuable, these other kinds of intelligence. So it's a more of a almost an ontological argument, an argument that its very being is, is valuable because of its life. Um, so that's the element or the interest uh, I had in that particular passage. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, um, maybe one last question for you. Uh, 
uh, you know, you mentioned Matt Bell's Appleseed. Uh, you mentioned a couple others. We just talked about um, the lives of animals. Are there other um, novels or films that you would point people to that, um, you know, that reading or watching could help grapple with some of these issues? Yeah, one of the uh, one of the books that really I, I enjoyed quite a bit and was almost a model for me in some ways was uh, Animals Strike Curious Poses. And that is um, a creative nonfiction Okay. And uh, by Elena uh, Pasarello, and really just incredibly moving stories that start with prehistory and then move into more, much more contemporary, like the story of Dumbo, and some of them that people may be familiar with, and others they're like, I had no idea this was going on. And so this kind of curiosity again about how humans are engaging with the non-human world and and much like my own book and i've kind of modeled parts of mine after hers is uh there are small chapters that can be read kind of bite-sized very you know kind of short just one potato chip uh you know i just want one potato chip i just want one little chapter but then once you're into it you can't put it down you keep reading it so I've really found that um, as a both uh, stylistically interesting. She's an excellent writer. Uh, so the, the each sentence follows the next in the way you kind of compels you to keep reading. And you're like, this is a beautiful word. This is such an apt description. And uh, provides that, again, that sense of a wonder of a, of a larger than human world. So that's one of the books that, has been really wonderful for me. Um, I just picked up uh, Ways of Being. Um, it just recently came out um, and by James Bridle. And that is on non-human intelligence um, from artificial intelligence and computers to animals and plants. So again, expanding this sense of what we think of as an, as an intelligence is... Uh, really quite powerful well thanks for that i'll i'm definitely going to add both of those to my list um is there anything you you want to add about your book or about the animal revolution or about any of these themes we've talked about um well thanks for asking and i would just say uh it was a, it was a project of passion i started collecting these incidents in 2005 so it was many years in the making and then finally, I found a stylistic way of writing that I thought was apt for the revolution and was able to put it into a book form. Um, it comes with a whole bunch of illustrations by yes. Marina Zerko, and they're super fun and playful and curious and sometimes a bit edgy. So um, I hope people can kind of enjoy that and kind of look at an illustration and think, wow, what's going on here? And then want to read a chapter, that kind of thing. So um, it's a lot of fun to put together. And uh, I hope people will uh, engage with it, take it both humorously and seriously, and then start looking around them for uh, evidence of a revolution. Well, great. Thank you so much for coming on the show and for writing Animal Revolution. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening. That was Ron Brolio, author of Animal Revolution. He briefly mentioned uh, Ed Young's book, An Immense World, which is a new book. Uh, that's actually coming up on our book club calendar on Tuesday, December 20th. Before we go, I do want to read out the uh, upcoming book club schedule because, like I said at the beginning, we are scheduled out through the end of the year, and I'm really excited about some of the titles. So next up is Thursday, September 29th. The Parable of the Sower by Octavia Butler. Then in October, switching to nonfiction, on Tuesday, October 25th, we have White Skin Black Fuel on the Danger of Fossil Fascism by Andreas Malm and the Zetkin Collective. Uh, really exciting news about that one is that Verso is giving a deal to uh, Patreon subscribers and newsletter subscribers of Storytelling Animals who want to join that book club uh, can get the book 50% off. 
So um, please sign up for our newsletter or sign up on Patreon to get the discount code. Um, uh, after that, uh, switching back to fiction is November 29th, another Tuesday, Salvage the Bones by Jesmyn Ward. And then finally in December, Ed Young's An Immense World, How Animal Senses Reveal the Hidden Realms Around Us. Um, that one is a new book, uh, fairly popular. Um, so for those who like to get their books from the library, I suggest putting in a hold relatively soon if you would like to join us Tuesday, December 20th. Um, other than September's, uh, the other three are going to be on the last Tuesday of the month, and the time for all of them is 8.30 Eastern, 5.30 Pacific. Um, I'll send out a Zoom link. Yeah, if you, if you want to join one of them as a free trial member, uh, just sign up for the free weekly newsletter. If you'd like to join more than one of those, uh, then, uh, sign up as a Patreon supporter at the Lorex tier or above. That's $7 a month. About think of it as two dollars an episode, and you get a free book club out of it. Um, what could be better than that, right? Um, so anyway, hope to see some of you there. Um, if if not, just hope you keep listening. Uh, like, subscribe, follow the podcast. We have a fun episode next week that is going to be about Tolkien, Lord of the Rings, and uh, non-human life and ecology. Uh, in celebration, I suppose, of the upcoming Rings of Power TV series. So talk to you then. Um, hope you have a good week. Hi. For more great iRaw podcasts, visit iRawPod.com. That's I-R-O-A-R-P-O-D.com. Ah.